I see them bothered in Umbu, all these Nigerians, not to exploit current situation for abnormal profit. As former APC chieftain Timmy Frank says, Nigerian economy is worse all that in Umbu. I am Bola Oba, and this is plus politics. President Bola Tinumbu has urged Nigerians not to exploit the country's current economic situation for abnormal profit. The president said this during an interview on Sunday. Prices of commodities and the cost of living have risen steadily since Tinumbu announced the removal of petrol, petrol subsidy in May. In October, the federal government launched conditional cash transfers to 15 million households to alleviate the effect of the economic crunch. The policy sparked debate on social media, with many criticizing it. Defending the scheme, Tinumbu said he believes, the, he believes in the, quote, efficacy of the cash transfer initiatives, uh, adding that it will assist, quote, the most vulnerable segments of our population, unquote. Meanwhile, former Deputy National Publicity Secretary of the All Progressives Congress, APC, Timmy Frank, as they cried the worsening socioeconomic conditions of Nigerians under President Bola Tinubu, Frank, in a statement issued on Monday, said Nigerians have faced the worst forms of economic hardships, pains, neglect, and hunger in the last six months of Tinubu's administration than any other time in the history of the nation. Joining us are economists Sheikh Gunshoputon and Mukhtar Mohamed. Gentlemen, welcome to Plus Politics. A pleasure. Uh, let Thank me start, you for having us. Let me start with you, Mukhtar. Mukhtar, uh, somebody told me that if I thought uh, things are scorching down south, that I need to go to the north, where a liter of petrol is averaging about 720, 730 naira per liter, where insecurity has literally uh, put the productive machinery of the state into comatose. Uh, what would you want to What would you want to tell us about the situation? Uh, in the northern part of Nigeria, as we speak, we know is a is a humongous, very big swaths of territory. But uh, at least uh, you, you probably have a more functional understanding of the situation there than some of us in Lagos. Yeah, definitely. I I lived all my life in the north. I have people in the north. My family house is in the north. So definitely, I can rightly talk about what is happening in the north. Um, the North has always been the poverty capital of Nigeria, no matter how anybody sees it. Um, they must have benefited in terms of the, the, the provide, um, producing the president of Nigeria. But in terms of prosperity, the North has been backward. Education, the backward. Out of the 20 million Nigerians that are added to poverty this year, I, can, I tell you, if you go to breaking down those data, about 15 million will come from the North. So, it's not a, a good situation when you look at the North and the crisis that we faced here in Northern Nigeria. But then again, uh, it, it, it has to do with the political class and also lack of education, are uh, all contributing factors that have um, held the North down. But again, you mentioned some of those things that you just mentioned, insecurity. The North used to be the food basket of Nigeria. And today, um, farmers can't go to their farm because of insecurity. Um, uh, even if you struggle to have children go to school, now nah, they, they don't even want to go to school, and their parents don't even want them to go to school. You remember the Alimajiri situation? It's, it's not just I mean, Alimajiri situation in the North. Now it's just that the number of children out of schools, even those that want to go to school, want to go to school, they can't go to school because of the insecurity. So it's when they talk about multi-dimensional poverty. I think that freeze is more common in the north than any other part of Nigeria. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, Mr. Shepiton, uh, 
uh, the president uh, using uh, leveraging one of the one of the most powerful tools of of a presidency in any in any liberal democracy, uh, preaching at uh, preaching at Nigerian entrepreneurs not to exploit their fellow citizens uh, by because they want to because they want to over over profit here. How would you respond to to that exhortation or that word of uh, word of uh, encouragement from the president? Well, um, there are there are several ways uh, to provide leadership, um, especially economic leadership uh, at a national level. Um, and to be fair, uh, moral suasion is not necessarily an unheard of um, approach or an unheard of method. Um, but it would always remain only that. It would always remain merely moral suasion. Um, it's one of the most, one of the least effective uh, ways that you could try to um, affect human behavior. You know, just to appeal to the sense of morality and appeal to the sense of right and wrong. You know, maybe some sense of altruism um, that might exist somewhere within their bowels. Um, <laughs> very, very few human beings uh, take decisions based on morality, especially when it comes to business. Uh, businesses are run based on hard, hard facts, facts, um, economic. Uh, considerations, economic factors, uh, uh, business considerations, business factors, financial considerations, financial factors, um, uh, things about that will determine how much profit you know a business would make versus how much losses it could potentially make. Um, those are the things that most organizations would consider. In fact, if you take, if you then step beyond that, usually that will be the first layer of uh, decision criteria that, that, that people uh, tend to follow uh, when they want to make business decisions. Maybe you then scale down a bit lower and say sometimes businesses may look at um, some social uh, responsibility uh, considerations and you find organizations pumping significant amounts of money into social corporate responsibility projects, you know, and all of that, just to continue to show the world that their businesses have a human face. But when it comes to pricing of their products, which have a direct bearing on the profit, profitability of their businesses and therefore the long-term sustainability of those businesses, you will really find businesses listening to moral um, uh, words, uh, uh, sermons, if you like, from political leaders. It just won't happen. Um, so the president asking uh, business, businesses, business concerns, business people, um, to, to not take advantage of the current situation um, and by overpricing their products and all of that. I'm sorry, it would always be nothing more than a sermon. People will do what they can do. People will believe they will do what they believe they need to do to survive one. And they will then go ahead and do what they believe they can get away with, even if it is beyond what they need to do to survive. You know, so... And that's where the issue of regulation, um, <coughs> excuse me, consumer protection, uh, competition, competition management, you know, uh, would come in. The role of the president and the role of the presidency and the federal government cannot be, in this very dire times, cannot be to appeal to the morality of the business world. It has to be to provide a mixed balance of um, policy um, instruments, policy framework, legislation, um, and regulation to, to manage how okay. these business entities behave, you know, in okay. these situations to ensure uh, that let, they do not try to exploit citizens. Let me you know, go you to can't preach, you, you have to regulate. Let me go to your colleague now. Uh, Mukta, uh, as a business person, I bought, I uh, I filled my stock 
or got my stock when the Naira was 650, 680 to a dollar. I, I, I'm selling now and I can see that uh, uh, I can see that the Naira is well over 1,000 Naira to a dollar and I, re and I will need to refill my stock. Should I still be selling at the price of, of uh, you know, the price I was selling when I brought in the goods at uh, 680 Naira to a dollar? And a friend of mine was actually telling me, he says, well, you know what? All these uh, uh, platitudes, he called it. He said all these platitudes are not necessary because it's a reality out there that because of the poverty level of Nigerians, there is even what that an average entrepreneur, an average entrepreneur now is contending with what he called uh, price resistance. That even when the reality is slapping you in the face that you need to increase your price, you just know that the market, your customers may not be able to afford this. Some of them are now selling at prices that we even take them out of the market because they may not be able to restock. How would you respond to, on the one hand, the president's exhortation, and the other hand, the remark by this uh, a friend of mine whose name I don't want to disclose, Mukta? Yeah, thank you, sir, again. And um, I think uh, Mr. Shegu have already said my mind, and you also said it's an exhortation from the president. Um, economic does not answer to preaching. Economics answer to policies. Uh, if you do the right policy, you don't need to preach. It's garbage in, garbage out. Demand and supply. That's what you need to do. So all these um, issues, uh, talking about market forces, you, you came to power, you made market forces to be very powerful. You say you want to run capitalism, and so market forces need to have the final say. And they're having the final say. And so what you need to do is to come up with policy that will make market forces begin to, to, to think about what they have in their final say. Then you decide the final say for them based on your policy. So all what the president is saying, and the president is a businessman, he's been in business before. He's been, he worked in the business company, he should know better. Um, no business will not take advantage of every situation, like you said. Uh, I buy a product at 600 and I know if I sell and I want to restock, I'll buy at 1,000. So why should I continue to sell at 600 when I know that uh, when I want to restock, I want to maximize profit. Capitalism in business is all about profit. So if you see any loophole to maximize profit, if you maximize profit, that's why you're in business. So when people talk about morality in business, morality in business is relative. It's relative because morality could be that I'm providing employment for a lot of Nigerians. So that's my moral, that's my moral standard. So I need to make money to provide, to pay them good salaries. So I, I don't believe in all these um, issues that say the businessmen are immoral. That they create the jobs. They know what they go through to create the jobs. So you come up with your own policy to make them drive down prices. It's only in Nigeria you get, you get to hear some things like price control, price regulation, price, you just get to do the right policies and everything with standard. You you get the right policy on crime. Yes, there's regulation. You need to regulate. And in regulating, you need to look at market forces. You need to look at market demands. You look to look at economic trends. You look to look at uh, microeconomic stability. Uh, like in the estate I said, that I, I stay at the point, they said, uh, oh, um, the, the Loma people should not increase their charges and this and that. But here, the estate himself were also increasing their own uh, charges to landlords and, uh, and tenants that are staying here. So and now you are saying somebody else should not increase. You know it doesn't work like that. The same economic cruelty that you are going to, that's what they are going to. Government has not been prudent, and I, I expected a lot of prudence with the economic situation we are having in this country with President Tinubu, but I'm not seeing that yet. Where a country will go out with about 400 and 400 and something delegates, and you have to sponsor for a, for 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 for, for a, a, a conference in Dubai that. At the end of the day, you will not be able to implement some of the policies that they are saying to implement because you lack the will, you lack the technology, you lack everything to make it work. So when people begin to talk about morality or immorality in the business, when I begin to ask them, where is the morality there? The morality for me is to provide job. The morality for me is to, to make that you put food on somebody table because government have not been able to do that. And government all over the world do not do that either. So I, I don't understand where the president is coming to say, don't care. Capitalism is all about taking advantage. That's the truth. That's the whole idea of capitalism. Every businessman, that's why you see, they will say it's tax evasion. Every businessman don't want to pay the right tax if he has the means. So he looked at other loopholes not to be able to pay. 
So that is how it is globally. That's, that's the beauty of capitalism. So as a government, I think you need to put the right policy down. You need to be market forces. Then in terms of market okay, forces, okay, okay, what policy are you putting to restrict market forces? Okay, I don't think uh, um, we should be bothering ourselves about the exhortation of Mr. President. Uh, Mr. He needs to Shepito, be right. Uh, let's get into some specifics now. Uh, the president, I, 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 I want to believe, uh, maybe, my, maybe my summation, uh, or my, my summary of the two opinions I'm hearing from you uh, may be wrong, but I'm, I'm, I'm hearing two gentlemen who are politely and respectfully saying that the, pres the president's preachment or exhortation amounts to uh, a kind of uh, economic superfluity that is not useful in economics, in basic economics. They uh, should be looking at policies. And when you say you should be looking at policies, uh, one who is reporting like me, or one who is uh, uh, where I am would say, okay, but some economists, uh, those of you economists who are, who are professionals here, yeah, celebrated some of his policies, removal of subsidy, uh, uh, deregulation or liberalization of the of the five window uh, forex market. Uh, but uh, these are the policies that are now, that are now precipitating the scorching circumstances that people find themselves. Uh, Mr. Shepkuton, how would you want to respond to that? Well, you know, this, 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 this thing that you talk about will, will not go away anytime soon. Um, it's just the reality. Uh, there, there is a divide amongst even policy experts as to the proprietary of these policies. You know, whether, one, whether they were necessary at all, and two, even if they were, whether the timing was right, three, three even if the timing was right, whether the approach was right. Um, and, you know, you find people of very well-respected members of uh, different professions falling on on either side of, of this conversation. Um, for me, I have been very open, very vocal about my opposition to the removal of subsidy from day one. Long before now, even the 2012 conversation, I said subsidy was not our problem. I still do not believe it, it, it has been our problem. I do not believe it has solved the problem, and we can actually see the evidence. Um, seven months you know, down the line, almost seven months now down the line, we can see that there hasn't been any savings um, in, in, in reality, in truth, except if we just want to lie to ourselves. What we have seen is that there has been an increase in FAC allocations as a result of the devaluation of the Naira. Um, and the, that gain for government, unfortunately, will not translate or percolate down to the population who are suffering from that very gain, the other side of that sword, who are suffering the effect of the other side of that sword. So while the, the, the government is gaining in revenue, let's even assume there's a saving in the subsidies, right? Um, the populace who the subsidies were supposed to, who the subsidy removal were supposed to help, were supposed to um, um, create an, uh, an environment and an economics uh, uh, environment where there can be development and progress and it can be better for them, um, they are not seeing that. And the reality is that those types of policies cannot result in the, you know, cannot achieve the result you're expecting in the short term. There are long-term um, um, solutions to long-term problems. So when you implement policies like that, you have to be prepared for the downside, for the flip side. And those flip sides come immediately the benefits come later. So how do you transit your people from the immediate problems such that they will be around to benefit from the long-term um, benefits? And that is where there is a cataclysmic failure on the part of government so far. Um, so look at the if effect of on, on inflation, for example. Before the subsidy removal, before the you know, unification of the exchange rate and all of that, inflation was already running out of control, right? And this was on the back of things that really were not local to Nigeria alone. 
So if you look at inflation in the United States and the United Kingdom, Canada, Russia, India, you know, even China, over the last two years, it had been rising. But if you look at what has happened to inflation in the United States, for example, as at last year, it was 8 points. It got as high as 10, 10% per annum. Guess how much inflation is today in the U.S.? 4.1. You know, in the United Kingdom, it's the same thing. It was 8 point something, 8.9 or thereabouts last year. We're down to 5, you know. And you can go across all the major developed economies around the world. The inflation has been curtailed with the instrumentation of the instrumentality of very, very clear port policy um, initiatives that have curtailed this thing, put it under control, and they can continue with the economic development and economic growth programs. That has not been the case in Nigeria. So we were part of that entire global problem up until, you know, um, um, when the subsidy thing came up. Instead of us being able to curtail our inflation, it's gone further out of control, and we're going to hit 30 According to analysts, we'll hit 30% before the end of this year. So you can clearly see that the policies themselves may have been good. The jury is still out. We don't know. But the immediate effect, we obviously did not prepare for. We did not think of how to manage those immediate effects to, to, to limit the damage it was going to have on the population who are already very, very deeply impoverished. And here we are today. It's clear that the... Okay, uh, Mokta. Hello, Mokta. Yes, I'm here. Okay, uh, we have a situation where the president says he's very confident that uh, the the palliative uh, distribution of uh, fifteen fifteen thousand naira to fifteen million, about you know about eleven to twelve percent of the multidimensionally poor Nigerians, that uh, it, will go, it will go a long way to alleviate their circumstance or ameliorate their condition. Uh, I, I, see, I see you smile. <laughs> I see you almost telling me politely that you, you this gentleman, is this, <laughs> is this, the, <laughs> let me let you, let, it's a question. However, seemingly, you know, saddening and funny, it may seem. How would you want to respond to that? Well, um, cash transfer is the new way of um, addressing poverty, but not the new way of addressing multidimensional poverty. And then when you're looking at cash transfer, cash transfer needs to be done with data. We need to ask ourselves, when, where did we get this policy of cash and has transferred it happened in the during the um, Asia economic, especially in Bangladesh, where they came up with this process of cash transfer. And that worked because of data. That worked also in America, also during the COVID-19 pandemics. And you saw that a lot of people that collected um, wire fraud through all those processes have been arrested because there's a system, there's a structure. In a country where you don't even know the number of poor people, you don't even know the number of citizens you have, population census have not been taken. And in a country whereby the National Bureau of Statistics came up with a new process of aligning poverty to mean that poverty is all about if you have a job for one for one day, that for one hour you get a job. That means you have a job. You, you, you could imagine what that means. That means every Nigerian that go to a site to work for one hour and that is not paid, is paid a, a, a one hourly or daily, it's not they say it's not employed. So they calculate that are underemployment, and by doing that, it's only three percent of Nigerians are not employed. So you can see a lot of um, uh, um, things that happen because we don't have data. Now, this this policy has been hijacked by politicians. Uh, all you need to do is just to think back about the trader money that was being distributed by the by the very previous administration, where the vice the then vice president went all around to give trader money. How what has happened to that money? It became a conduit pipe for corruption. It became a conduit pipe to to buy vote for, for people to vote for them. So I, I don't actually believe in a cash transfer policy because uh, we don't have the data to support that. And again, who is poor? Who is the poor of the poor? Because they said now in Nigeria, we have the poor. We saw before we have the poor, we have the poor of the poor before the poor. So who is the poor of the poor? And if you are transferring about 10,000, 15,000, how much will it be able to do? That means it's not even up. It's not even up to like and twenty dollars if you look at today exchange rate. So that's what you are transferring to individuals to make their living. So um, 
I don't think that policy has worked. I remember when the current minister came up and Betty, he said about it that uh, he, he, the, the register was bad, they have to clean up the register. So they finished cleaning up the register and then they are doing the tax transfer. And uh, this thing normally get politicized because sometimes they say, okay, you are a member of APC, you get the cash transfer. Politicians use that as a tool to win elections. And opposition that are in opposition in the state, but they are they are, they are the ruling party in, in the centers also use that. To, I, I can assure you that that will happen very soon in the Edo election. You see that most of the cash transfer will be done during those periods. So it's all about um, politicizing every good policy that we have in Nigeria. And it's so, so bad. But again, this policy has not worked because we don't have the, the, the data to back up some what we are doing. Okay, let me see if uh, Mr. Sh if Shopiton is back now. Uh, I shall go back. Okay, um, okay, uh, Mukta, uh, as we speak, apart from the cash transfer, uh, immediately after the subsidy removal, we were hearing about uh, uh, the federal government uh, putting in place a very articulate policy to help in uh, the conversion of vehicles, especially mass transit vehicles. Here you go again. Here you go again. You are turning this. You are turning this program to a comedy show. <laughs> uh, that uh, putting policies in place you know, to to help in the articulation of uh, conversion, especially of uh, uh, commercial vehicles. Uh, from using uh, dirty fossil fuel, PMS and uh, uh, and diesel, uh, to using relatively lighter fossil fuel, but still dirty, but relatively cleaner CNG in particular, because uh, a, a liter equivalent of CNG is under 200 naira. And a liter of uh, diesel is now 1,250, 1,350, depending on location. Uh, what's your take of how well the, the, the government has gone about uh, implementing this policy? Have you seen any of those buses? Uh, not quite. Maybe because I, you know, maybe because I drive, you know, I don't take public transport. I wouldn't know. If those buses, if those are, buses are, if those buses are around, the government would have made a noise and would have displayed it even in Plus TV. They would have made an, a paid adversaria to tell us that those buses are around. It's only Lagos State government and it's a PPP and uh, 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 policy whereby I think some of the vehicles, some of the BRT buses were supposed to drive by by these, and it was a PPP uh, issue between the Lagos State government and uh, and the corporation. So um, those buses cannot come earlier than first quarter of next year. And so what it means is that the people will keep suffering until then. We we see when we talk about when you when you come up with policies and you want to have an impact on the people, you talk you come up with structural palliative. You don't come up with um, palliative, and that is where I I have an issue with labor. I think labor should go for structural palliative. Structural palliative has to do with if you earn more, you have to pay us more. Not but as we stand now, the states, the federal government, and the local government have collected more revenue than they have ever collected before. And most of these states are still struggling to pay a living wage. Some of them have not left 18,000 Naira minimum wage up to this moment. They've not, they have refused to, to negotiate with labor. And the federal government have been playing politics also with negotiating with labor to come up with a firm national minimum wage. So that shows you that most of the issues that we are trying to do in terms of addressing uh, the issues that brought about multi-dimensional property, we are paying late service to it. If you talk about those buses, we all know and they know that those buses cannot come in anytime soon. It, it takes a lot to get about a thousand of those buses to Nigeria. So we have to wait and in our waiting, what are the people enjoying? Outside of the government telling us that today that they have about 250, uh, they have about 250 billion of subsidy of electrical el electricity, which for me is fantastic. That is when you spend money like that, it's, it's, it's also good because you are not just spending it to a few that benefited in the subsidy scheme, 
but he's touching every Nigerian because every Nigerian that has power at a particular time is enjoying subsidy comparable to the subsidy that was being enjoyed by the few that are the cabal in the oil industry. So I was a good advocate of removal of subsidy, and I still stand that subsidy was a scam, and that we can go on and on and talk about that. Like make you give you a lot of reason why I think subsidy was a scam. Now, now the government policies they come up with. Why have we not seen those impacts? Like uh, Mr. Shekekon said to talk before he went on, we went off. Some of these policies are long term driven. But in the long term, what are you doing in the short term? You need to, when you're trying to address policy, you need to okay. have the short term, Shabu, Shabu the long back. term, the middle term, and the Shabu short term. Back. Let's uh, also give him the opportunity to catch up uh, with some of, the, some of the things we've discussed in his absence. Uh, your colleague, Shagun, is of the belief that uh, uh, he has not seen any serious-minded policy articulation to address, especially uh, the short-term uh, short uh, punitive effects of some of the policies of, uh, like, subsidy removal, like... Uh, like uh, uh, a forex liberaliza liberalization of the... So uh, how would you want to respond to that? I didn't quite catch a question, especially, you know, uh, yeah, I, the policy, I, how, how we're going to respond. I said, like I said in your absence, the, 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 your colleague Mokhtar was saying that he agreed with you that uh, the, the short-term plans to, uh, to ameliorate the conditions of the citizenry have been so, so lacking that even if these things will work in the long term, in the short term, it's like uh, the people have been thrown to the, uh, to the sharks. Uh, so, uh, and I'm saying, okay, what are some of the ideas we shouldn't just be finger pointing now. What are some of the ideas that somebody like you would uh, rather like to see? Uh, we spoke. I spoke with him concerning CNG, and he asked me a frank question: If I had seen those vehicles, you know, running on our streets, I probably would. I have not seen any. If I've seen, and I don't even know where they will refuel if they if they put those buses on the streets. But how would you want to respond to the fact that, uh, and, and also give some, some, some suggestions? Well, look, um, the reality, uh, if we're being honest with ourselves with that, you can never, you can't have a short-term response to a long-term problem. A, 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 a policy that is trying to provide a long-term solution long-term uh, uh, benefits to the entire country and the entire um, uh, economy. You can't have short-term measures that can ameliorate the effects. It's practically impossible. I have thought about this. You can run all the models you want to run, and you find that in the end, if you try whatever short-term measures you want to put in place to deal with the impact, the short-term impact of these supposedly good policies, um, the cost implications would rubbish the need to have taken those decisions in the first place. The amount of money that you will need to spend to push in the impact of subsidy removal will be so high that removing the subsidies might have then become uh, uh, completely uh, unnecessary even if the argument from other quarters might be no, that might not be true because you can spend, if, if I'm saving 4 trillion naira per annum, for example, um, in subsidies, and I spend 4 trillion naira this year, and I spend 4 trillion naira next year to provide um, palliative, so to speak, um, at least if the implication of that is that in the third year, by year three, or by year four, I am no longer spending that four trillion naira per annum. Then what I've done is that I've converted the subsidy, um, uh, I've converted that line item in my budget that says subsidy. I've converted it to different programs that are uh, 
targeting the citizens uh, and trying to push in the impact of the subsidies in the first year and the second year. And then by the third year, the four trillion that I was spending on subsidy or the four trillion I will be spending on palliatives will be out of my budget entirely. So I've, I've spent um, two years um, trying to provide some sort of short-term solutions um, um, to provide some sort of short-term solutions uh, while saving money uh, for the fourth year. Um, to, to, you know, so so that that is an argument. Um, however, for me, I don't think that there is any um, short-term benefits or short-term solutions to this subsidy problem or even to the exchange rate unification policy. I think what should have happened, and this is the answer to your question, what should have happened is that we should have taken a medium-term um, outlook to the implementation of these policies and then use that medium-term period to prepare for the um, uh, pushing of the impact of these policies when they are eventually implemented. So you give yourself two years, for example. So the president could have announced on May 29th and said, um, we are planning to remove subsidies. Um, this is our target date. And then between now and then, we are going to deploy 20,000 CNG stations all across the country. We're going to provide um, so so and so amount of money in loans, maybe one trillion naira in loans to enable people to change their power sources so that people can then uh, maybe install uh, solar panels, you know, in their businesses and in their homes and in their offices, you know, with help of, from government, you know, and so on and so on. So many other policies. The buses that you want to roll out, give yourself time to buy them. You go through the public procurement process, buy them, go through the public procurement process, um, uh, and then, you know, uh, engage the people that are going to be running it. You know, these things will take time. It takes maybe, let's say, a year, a year and a half, maybe two years. So you start that process, begin to implement those things. And then at a particular point, you have some sort of hurdle or trigger point in the implementation program. Then you will know that okay, we're ready. Then you can then announce, uh, you know, subsidy is gone, you are unifying exchange rates and any other thing you want to do. So by the time you are doing that, the inflationary impact that you would have seen without having done those things would have been curtailed to a significant, significant extent. So we didn't do this, and that's why we're seeing what is going on now. We simply went ahead to uh, bluster our way through the problem. Now, the argument some people would give is that if the president had made these types of announcements during his speech, that would have given a warning, you know, to the cartels, you know, like Mukta says, it's, it's a scam, you know, and if, they, if it's a scam, then there are obviously some scammers behind it. So maybe that would have given a warning to these scammers, and then they would have also had a counter uh, initiative to sabotage the entire thing and all of that. And I, my response to that has always been, look, this is all about leadership and will. If you really, really want to do these things, we'll do them regardless of whose ox is bought. And I think this is really where the problem is. Because what we have done is that we have looked at the lowest hanging fruit, in quotes, you know, we've looked at the path of least resistance, in quotes, and in this situation, the lowest hanging fruit and the part of least resistance, unfortunately, is the people, are the people of Nigeria, who we know can do nothing. They are powerless, you know, as against a, a few okay. 1,000 okay, people this, who can, who can sabotage this the entire up, process of government. Let me put this follow-up to Mokta. Mokta, uh, somebody may want to say that, you know what, but the president met a reality... Uh, that spoke to the fact that um, uh, the subsidy, uh, the subsidy budget, was literally, literally empty. Uh, was going to be was going to be non-existent. Uh, just about a month to the day, he said subsidy was gone. So uh, even if he wanted the subsidy regime to continue. Uh, the reality was such that the budgetary allocation could only last till the end of June when it was being sworn in on the 29th of May. How would you respond to that? Well, I, 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 I think the president said it also in his, um, in his speech that, I mean, later after we heard that that was not in his speech, he decided to come up with it himself. And he said it also, he alluded to that, that 
he came up with that himself. It was not in his original speech. And that tells you that the policymakers like uh, Mr. Shoton said must have looked at it, would have been thinking of coming up with policy on ground before you come up with the poly with um, this the removal of subsidy. But I for one, like I said, I felt that subsidy was not doing more to our economy, was doing more damage to our economy than what we we're gaining in the long run. And like he said, that also has to do because government were not really in charge of subsidy because we didn't even know how, how much subsidy we we're paying, what we we're paying subsidy for. Because um I, I remember during the uh, during the pandemic where, where everybody was at home, Nigeria was still consuming more fuel than than like if we we're going out every day. So that gives you the fact that uh, subsidy was just being used uh, as, as a scam to make some other people rich. So many Nigerians have become rich in because of subsidy po policy of the government. Those all various government, not uh, not uh, only the last government. So definitely, I, I think. Um, and that's where I think um, soil subsidy was, was, was had to go. And for me, it's one of the best uh, policy. Now, was it the right time to have done that? I, I, I think. Well, I don't mind say the right time for the best policy is now. So, if that was going, to, but I, I totally agree with him that we didn't put um, measures on ground to tackle some of the challenges that we are going to face with those subsidy removal. But the way that subsidy should have gone, I think it should have gone earlier than. And when he decided, remember before then, President Buhari was saying he was going to get go late subsidy by January. But that part was spending about six point something trillion in subsidy alone. I don't think that was good for our economy. Our economy was bleeding. But like you said, there was no even allocation after June. I think the president decided to take the bull by the horn and make that um, statement. I, my own challenge is like what he said um, was in the floating of the currency. Uh, in that one, it's, it's a straight way of uh, if you want to float your currency, you make sure you have the liquidity. Uh, you don't allow your currency uh, to be uh, to be uh, battered by, um, uh, by market forces. Shagun, we really have to wrap it up at this juncture. Uh, thank you so much, so much, gentlemen. We really appreciate you. Uh, your contributions have been so, so uh, enlightening. Thank you.